available afterwards on Heoni's YouTube channel. Uh, speakers, please keep your cameras on if possible, and then of course your mics off when you're not speaking. And for all the other participants, we ask to keep your mics off and also cameras here, unless you want to keep them on. Um, and for all questions and comments, we ask you to use the raise your hand function. Uh, and this applies also to panelists as well as to participants. Uh, but then you can also use the chat function uh, for asking questions and also for a discussion. Uh, and as we have many uh, prominent experts online today, I know that you can also have a kind of an ongoing uh, fruitful discussion in the chat function if you like. Uh, this webinar is also part of Heuni's 40th anniversary celebrations. Uh, we're turning 40 years this year. Uh, and if you like, please sign up for a newsletter to hear more about our activities. We will share the link in the chat. All right, that's about the technicalities. We have quite a tight program. We will start with a short introduction by myself, uh, where we talk a bit about the background to this issue. And then it will be followed by a presentation by Annina and Anna Greta. And then we will have a panel discussion with our prominent experts focusing on these three themes. Um, and I think without further ado, we will go to the setting the scene part of the presentation. Anna Greta, you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, Heuni is situated in, in Finland, uh, and we in Finland worked quite extensively on uh, labor exploitation and the exploitation of migrant workers. Uh, and we've at Heuni been start, we've started to think perhaps this is some kind of a Finnish exceptionalism, because compared, for instance, to our Nordic neighbors, uh, the exploitation of migrant workers has received much more attention here than it has in the other countries. Um, so as a kind of background, the exploitation of migrant workers was recognized in Finland already some 20 years ago. Um, and extortionate work discrimination, which is a very specific criminal provision, uh, and human trafficking were both criminalized the same year in 2004. What is interesting in the Finnish situation is that we've identified far more victims of labor trafficking than for sexual exploitation, which is quite different, I think, from many other countries. And we also have more case law on labor exploitation and or trafficking for forced labor than all the other Nordic countries. So the situation in Finland is, in Finland is quite different. I can take the next slide. And one of the reasons for this is that we have a very broad interpretation of forced labor. Uh, instead of looking at the um, elements of control uh, as violence or force, we look at the comprehensive control of the worker by the employer. And in this uh, central has been the understanding of the position of dependency and the insecure status, uh, which is shown in our case law. So the focus has been on the factors that hinder the person from leaving the work uh, rather than a mere force. And this has resulted in a situation where we, as I said, have many more convictions uh, than our neighboring countries. If you go to the next slide. Uh, and one of the discussions that we've had at Heuni and also in Finland is that the exploitation of migrant workers shouldn't just be seen as kind of individual bad employers who exploit these workers, but also as a result of, of many kind of structures that enable exploitation. So it's of course related to political, social and economic priorities, uh, which make some people more vulnerable to exploitation than others. And in our research, we've tried to show that labor exploitation is a low risk, high gain form of corporate crime, not just crime, but corporate crime, which is motivated by economic factors. And then, in fact, there are many uh, structures which are perfectly legal that actually are used to hide this form of exploitation. Uh, examples include cascade subcontracting, the posting of workers, and this uh, now quite common bogus self employment. And this is something we try to raise in our research that is actually hidden in these legal structures. This was a very brief introduction, and I'll now give the floor to Annina and Anna Gret. Please. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Uh, we will now talk a little bit about our recent uh, research on the multi-agency responses to labor exploitation in, in selected European countries. And just to start with um, a few words about the study itself. 
Um, it was commissioned by the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment of Finland, and uh, the study was conducted by Heoni. Uh, we did a desk review and uh, group interviews, and in total we talked with uh, 28 experts from uh, different um, fields and different countries in Europe. And the six countries in the study um, were the Netherlands, Belgium, the United Kingdom, Norway, Sweden and Estonia. Um, the re report was written in Finnish, uh, but a summarized version in English will be published early next year. Over to you, Annina. Uh, thanks. So we can go to the next slide. Um, first, we will cover some of the challenges that set the scene then for our discussion with the, the panelists as well. And one of the key um, challenges that we identified when we were doing this study was the, the definition of labour exploitation and, and, and indeed the framework for combating this phenomenon varies in, in these six countries that our study covered. Um, so we had examples like modern slavery in the UK, uh, which is uh, of course a broader concept than, than trafficking. And then in the Norwegian discussion, uh, labour crime was a relevant term and it enables a more structural approach to, um, to this issue. Um, and, and then for example, in, in Belgian context, the uh, broad definition of, of trafficking uh, for forced labour. So um, you don't have to prove forced labour, but rather you can um, focus on exploitation of a person in circumstances that violate human dignity. So, so indeed, uh, this has resulted that there are more judgments and, and investigations and cases that are identified in, in the Belgian context. So all this um, give then um, a, a varied response uh, to, to the problem at hand. If we'll go to the next slide, um, we also identify this, what we call the criminalization gap. So uh, a, a key challenge for, for, for um, uh, interrupting this kind of criminality is that uh, there are lack of criminal offenses to address serious labor exploitation if it cannot be qualified as, as human trafficking for the purpose of forced labor or uh, using the trafficking framework. Um, so how there's this big gap between mere infringements of the labor law and then and trafficking, and it's a really big gap. And, and, and also this gap has very significant impact on the rights of, of victims um, and, and what they can do um, based on whether or not their experience is qualified as human trafficking or mere labor exploitation. Um, and, and we also identified that the threshold for uh, trafficking for forced labor is particularly high in, in many countries. And this might be the result of a lack of, of case law, lack of understanding on, on the phenomenon and lack of um, experience, for example. But these uh, examples we identified, for example, from Sweden, but, but also to a certain degree in, in the Netherlands. And then if we go to the next, uh, so the, the final challenge that we identified <laughs> that we want to highlight in this presentation was uh, access to justice. So um, uh, the conclusion is that from all, from all the six countries that for many migrant workers or most migrant workers, the, the most important issue for them is to get access to remedy and have effective means of obtaining their unpaid wages. Um, but if, if their experience is not qualified as trafficking, they lack serious options in getting, for example, uh, legal aid. So um, legal aid is often not free of charge for, for persons of uh, uh, victims of mere labor exploitation. And, and then if they have to take into consideration that you would need to hire a, a lawyer to, to help you, um, uh, that's a, a very long process and, and risky also. So that, that's a, like a major barrier for victims to uh, access justice. Um, then if we go to the next part of our presentation, 
uh, we highlight some of some recommendations. Um, actually, all together, our report contains uh, 14 themes uh, of a set, set of recommendations per topic, but we selected here a couple of ones that are uh, relevant to this discussion we're having today. And one of the key issues that we really want to highlight and recommend is the strengthening of uh, multi-agency cooperation. Um, and uh, addressing this phenomenon, labor exploitation, really requires systematic and institu institutionalized cooperation between labor inspectors, the police, tax authorities, and, and other key actors. And um, in the uh, research, we uh, identified some well functioning multi agency cooperation. Um, models, for example, from Belgium, Norway, and, and the UK. And, and the key issue is in those is that they had um, clear models and, and division of, of tasks between dif different authorities. So that's uh, very important. And, and then if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, the, the role of um, uh, labor inspectors is also something that we want to highlight here. Um, uh, the, the mandates and their working methods and structures really vary greatly from one European country to another. And in, in the countries that we examine, for example, in, in Belgium and Netherlands, the, the labor inspectors actually have the mandate to investigate the labor trafficking cases. Uh, whereas in the Swedish context, the, the labor inspection authority there doesn't even have the, the mandate to monitor um, terms of employment or wages. Um, but what is uh, clear um, from, from this is that uh, labor inspectors really require sufficient resources as well as more training and capacity to tackle labor exploitation. And this requires prioritization from the organization to this topic and, and, and also kind of political will and uh, importance that is given to this, this subject matter. And, and then on Nakreta will continue with our last set of recommendations. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so we included the Estonian Labour Dispute Committee uh, as a promising practice for claiming unpaid wages from the employer. Um, the committee proceedings are faster than criminal or civil proceedings, and uh, it's not necessary for the migrant worker to hire a legal counsel for the hearing, but instead the victim um, support services, for example, can uh, help the worker filling all necessary paperwork and to gather evidence. So we thought that this is something that could be um, considered also, for example, in Finland. Um, as we know, labor exploitation is motivated by profit making. Uh, so the current penalties for crimes that are not defined as um, trafficking are not sufficient um, to intervene in the activity. Uh, criminal entrepreneurs, um, they try to, for example, circumvent business plans by transferring their businesses to other persons or setting up new businesses and also avoid their obligation in different, way, different ways, um, for example, through bogus self-employment or posted worker schemes. And that is why there is a need to develop new ways to use financial sanctions and to confiscate proceeds of crime. Thank you. These were our recommendations for this presentation. Thank you, Anna Greta and Annina, for this introduction and also on a brief overview of our recent research uh, looking at different models in different European countries. Uh, I'll now continue to the panel discussion. Uh, so we have three prominent panelists, as I already mentioned. Uh, each of the panelists has about five minutes to introduce themselves and also to reply to some uh, questions that we've sent beforehand. And also then to, of course, talk about your own research. We have about 15 to 20 minutes uh, for each topic. Uh, so I also ask all participants to keep this in mind so that we have time for discussion. So we'll start with topic one, uh, which is looking at sanctions and corporate crime, which was something that Anna Greta and Anina just mentioned. So we will turn to John. Uh, 
Heonis and also your own research uh, shows that existing sanctions, uh, especially financial ones, are insufficient to deal with labor exploitation uh, since the risk for these companies and actors is often really risk of getting caught is often very low. And at least uh, or in the countries that we've looked at, many of the sanctions are quite lenient. Um, but if labor exploitation is a structural issue, as I tried to outline in my introduction, and also embedded in perhaps in even in corporate practices, um, and also because there's a lack of sufficient law enforcement control and oversight. Um, I know you've researched uh, corporate crime in particular, and you've shown that labor exploitation is indeed linked to corporate crime. How do you see the corporations engaging in labor exploitation could be made more accountable and more efficiently than today? This was a long introduction, but maybe you would answer. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Natalia. And hi, everyone. I'm John Davis. I'm a lecturer in criminology at the University of Manchester. So as Natalia mentions, I've done <clears throat> some research on modern slavery in the agricultural and food industries, as well as the construction industry as well. So there's a few themes within um, Natalia's introduction that I'd like to pay a bit of attention to in the limited time that I've had. But I think <clears throat> overall, one of the central messages is that I think there needs to be a much more proactive and wide ranging set of interventions, which uh, Natalia and Anina and Anna Greta alluded to in their presentation, in their overview. So on the one hand, you could you could frame that from a very broad perspective, such as reducing inequality or challenging the existing capitalist system. But in terms of some on the ground issues, um, part of the problem is that policy and organisational responses tend to be quite reactive, quite haphazard and in response to a particular scandal or high profile event. So I'm thinking of the Morecambe Bay incident in, in 2004 in the UK where 23 Chinese cockle pickers drowned and that um, the year after led to the creation of the Gang Masters Licensing Authority. So in a sense, reaction to these kind of events does have a role to play, but too often that's dominated the political agenda and the way that companies and corporations often react to, to those things um, at the expense of more proactive interventions. Um, so what sort of things do I mean by proactive? Well, I suppose exploitation can be prevented in a sense, or at least uh, challenged in, in the first instance by strong representation of labour rights. So we might think of the role of trade unions and backed up by a properly resourced labour inspectorates. And those two factors can be important because they help to bring to light a, a number of hidden factors and subtle practices. So we've already alluded to that spectrum of exploitation, those, those hidden practices and the more routine practices. So they can help to create um, a greater sense of collective worker strength over employers who then might face a stronger worker voice backed up by that strong state inspection. So I guess all of that's easier said than done, but it's probably more of a wish list or a starting point for discussion. So I guess in terms of addressing exploitation, if it's already happened or if it's already happening, I think as, as is the case with organised crime research more generally, you know, organised crime policy, a lot of policy responses tend to shoot ahead of available research and supporting evidence for assessments and interventions. So you can go as far back as the Kefauver Committee in the US in the 1950s and with many organised crime policies since then. So arguably there needs to be an approach that takes into account not just situational circumstances. Uh, for example, if there was a particular organised crime group or individual rogue employer, but um, as, as others have pointed out in, in previous research, uh, a more wide ranging analysis of supply chain vulnerabilities and maybe associated state practices that may have contributed. So uh, immigration policy or labour market oversight and, and welfare policy, for example. Um, some would even say, as a, as a kind of way forward, to, to mechanise some of the jobs and that way you remove some of the immediate situational pressures. But of course, that might work for, thumb, for some types of jobs, but not others. And if you're picking soft fruit in a field, for example, then a machine might be too heavy handed for that sort of thing. So in terms of the sanctions, I mean, the theme of this topic is labour exploitation. So to me, as with others, that will imply that we're not just talking about 
the most severe practices, i.e. modern slavery and, and human trafficking and so on, but also these greyer areas and, and the more banal, normalised forms of exploitation. Um, I won't say too much about that, that spectrum because I think that Amy and Annette will also elaborate on that. But what it does tend to mean is that you have different sanctions that may be appropriate for different forms of exploitation and, and of course there's no single approach. So many people talk about criminal responses to modern slavery, but I think the key question for me is how to bring these greyer, these more um, normalised areas of exploitation into the regulatory remit. And then we start going into other types of sanctions that might be civil, that might be financial rather than criminal, um, but it might still serve as a form of accountability for, for workers to think, yes, somebody is taking this seriously. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just finish off on a couple of brief points. Uh, how do we actually get to these businesses that exploit and, and benefit from exploitation? Uh, again, you're going to have a range of interventions, a range of answers ranging from take a very tough line towards businesses, so bring in criminal prosecutions, all the way down to the other extreme of let them self-regulate, let them get on with it themselves. Um, so to some extent that might depend on your views around business regulation and, and free markets. Um, so we might think of a, a combination of, of the so-called carrot and stick approach, where on the one hand, you could say it's helpful to take businesses with you as a way to encourage organisational change. Uh, that may work or it may not, if we think of those profit motives, in which case you've got the, ideally, the, the stick of criminal sanctions and the associated reputational damage. Um, so I think that ties into some of the points that we've already mentioned around some businesses not even being aware of exploitation occurring further down their supply chains due to that subcontracting practice uh, where you've often got legitimate businesses using outsourcing and subcontracting as a, as a way to solve a legitimate business problem. Um, one solution that people have mentioned is you could try to limit the number of tiers in the supply chain as a way to keep a tighter oversight of subcontractors. Uh, of course, that can be a problem because many of the practices that we're talking about in relation to subcontracting are already hidden and they're highly casual, they're highly informal. So uh, that that could be that could just be a way of displacing the problem. So, um, yeah, as a way to when you actually get to those businesses, you've also got the idea, do you try to engage and influence them with the expectation they'll improve or do you drop them from your supply chains, in which case that could actually drive those businesses further underground and doesn't make the problem go away. So those are some of my initial thoughts. Uh, you need to have a, a more proactive approach towards exploitation. You need to have a range of sanctions brought into the regulatory remit, and you need to get to some businesses through that combination of the carrot and stick approach with the possibility of genuine punishment for them. So yeah, I, I think as Genevieve Le Baron writes, uh, the question about whether these interventions work. It's it's less about yes they will or no they won't, but it's more about maybe and, and sometimes. Um, but if you've got a range of those measures in place, then maybe you've got a better chance of something working. So I'll stop there because I think I've run over a little bit. Thanks, John, for a very comprehensive reply. I think you had a lot of really interesting thoughts. Uh, but I perhaps want to ask the other panelists if you want to comment on on John's views. On it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting introduction and and uh, I'm very impressed with how much you managed to get through in five minutes um, and uh, definitely listening and learning. And uh, and I think I just want to uh, I just want to pick up an echo on, on my my agreement with with I think one of the, these points that you you closed on the, the point. Will it work? Well, maybe and sometimes. And I think it underlines the necessity of following up on the on the, on the evidence base. And because I think that coming from the trafficking field myself, but also working on exploitation generally, I think that sometimes discussions can be a little bit of a shot in the dark and there can be a lot of opinions about how how things will probably work that gets translated into it will work and then then and then so i think that also perhaps urging a little bit of caution in the type of of discussions that we have i mean even today when we're talking about different different models from different countries i think we always need to be very cognizant of of the institutional setting that we are introducing 
uh, different measures into because I think there is a tendency to think that we can we can look for solutions that have worked elsewhere. Uh, of course, introducing things into such a highly complex um, societal area as well as as the labor market, really, and anything to do with criminal justice regulation of corporations and so on. I think all of these these international measures will or or um, or or uh, things we borrow from elsewhere or, or looking to OK, this worked this worked here. Um, we we all the time need to be aware of how it interacts with the existing structures in in a country. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Annette. Um, I see that Amy has joined us as well. Would you like to to comment on? Hi, we'd like to comment on John's John's introduction. Yes, absolutely. Um, and ag again, I um, I also echo um, the main points that he's made. And I think I'd like to just um, pick up on the uh, issue of um, the sanctions aspect, um, and particularly when it comes to financial and administrative administrative sanctions, because um, as you mentioned in the overview of the, um, your most recent research, is that there are many strategies that are used by unscrupulous employers in um, terms of transferring their business to a different sector or simply closing down and setting up with a new name and a new board of directors potentially um, and that is something which then can cause significant can hamper investigations and then also the confiscation of assets um, and if we do really want to hit them where it hurts in terms of the financial aspect I think that's something that really needs to be stepped up at quite an earlier stage in investigations already when labour inspectors are making their initial investigation um, and also very much Something that came out of uh, some research I did with um, on an ILO study was the uh, emphasis that we need to make in terms of making sure that any sanctions or any monies that are recuperated are very much then also borne in mind when it comes to paying any unpaid wages of, for the workers themselves and making sure that those financial uh, that money that is recuperated is then potentially used um, to uh, provide access to justice for the victims. Um, and I think that's something that also needs to be borne in mind when we're thinking about what the sanctions, the purpose of the sanctions that we're imposing, um, and especially when we go beyond criminal um, sanctions as well, which I agree with, but we also need to take into account um, making sure that we provide access to justice as well. Thanks, Amy. Uh, this reminds me of, of something that we worked at, with at Helmi, which is, um, as, as John said, not just uh, the stick, but also the carrot. Uh, we worked with businesses and also now with public procurement agencies to make them cognizant of the fact that there is labor exploitation also in national supply chains, not just in global supply chains, uh, and to address those uh, in their own work, for instance, in cleaning, construction, catering transport and so forth and we're actually launching a guide now for public procurement officials uh, on how to take into account the prevention of labor exploitation in, in public national public procurement uh, in the Finnish context but it's also applicable to, to other settings um, so I, I think this is an example of of the, of the carrot perhaps as well and also kind of some form of regulation from within the business sector itself um, but I'm thinking, John, you've done research on exploitation both in the construction sector and also in food production uh, and in food processing. So um, do you think that there's some comparisons between the two sectors in terms of these kind of structural factors uh, that make these two sectors prone to exploitation? Yeah, well, I guess in, in uh, again, I'm thinking primarily of the UK context, but you've got um, the, the agricultural and food sectors that are licensed by the GLAA, the, the Gang Masters and Labour Abuse Authority, whereas construction doesn't have a full licensing uh, system in place. Now, that doesn't mean that the GLAA can't do anything about any concern. So if, if you're a construction worker or, or, or if the GLAA get a, a report about exploitation occurring in the construction industry, they can investigate. It's just that they can't do that that full on licensing regime as in the same way as they can in the agricultural and food sectors. Um, but yeah, I mean, despite that, <clears throat> the the GLAA and this is hardly a new point, but uh, have been significantly under resourced. They don't necessarily have the uh, the ability or, or the that that power of remit as I've mentioned to carry out their responsibilities effectively. Although 
you know, when they when they do carry out a properly resourced inspection or investigation, it can be quite effective. I mean, the two sectors in themselves, a lot of production in agriculture and food processing can be more rural, especially fields and farm work that can occur in more isolated areas. So, of course, you're going to have um, if, if you've got a high dependency on migrant workers, for example, then it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to just walk down the street and, and talk to somebody about their problems. Um, and yet in construction, you know, although that can be in isolated areas too, that's also happening within um, within very public areas, very, very busy areas potentially. And yet there still seems to be the problem of underreporting. So again, part of the problem comes down to this heavy reliance on self-employment and subcontracting where workers might only be employed on a on a given project for a number of days or even weeks. So that can make settling in and getting to know the area and, and the different conditions quite quite difficult. So yeah, those are some comparisons that I've noticed between the two areas, and yet, and yet they are still seen as among the most vulnerable when it comes to industry discussions. Thanks, John. Uh, Anne, I would like to comment, please. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, th thanks for pointing out the, the differences uh, between those two sectors, John. And I, I just wanted to comment that it, it, in the finished context, we've been for years wondering about the construction sector that we don't have. Um, like we know that there's a labor exploitation occurring in, in the construction sector, but we don't necessarily have these these um, trafficking cases and I mean trafficking convictions from from that sector. And it's always like there's a lot of money uh, involved in, in the construction sector and, and a lot of these subcontractings and people are coming and going, as you pointed out, and, and different schemes are used. Um, but we also, I, I kind of wonder about that, the, the victims and, and their profile in, in this way, that they are men and, you know, and, and, and that the, it, it is difficult for them to maybe talk about this phenomenon and seek help. So, so I think that that might be also one of the kind of barriers that we would have to when it comes to identification. But I don't know what you guys think about this. Yeah, some quick comments if you want, and then we'll move on to the second topic. John, please. Uh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, the uh, the gender aspect is is important as well, and I think that came up in uh, so so um, just as a bit of background, we um, we in conjunction with Payuni and, and University of Turku, um, we did some research on the construction industry and that notion of corporate responsibility, corporate accountability, and yeah, the, the, there was a feeling among some of the people that we spoke to, so people in law enforcement and, and victim support organizations that yeah because you've got a large number of male workers in construction then of course they, there might be some development of a, a bit of a macho culture where they're um you know more reluctant to speak out about their their own experiences of being exploited so yeah i'd, I'd say that's um that's definitely important something that came up in in the research that we did thanks john uh, if I may add, I think one of the challenges is also that the, the supply chains in, in construction are so complex that at least in our experience that really makes, for instance, police investigations very difficult. Um, and also then the fact that many of the workers are posted workers, uh, so the kind of following that kind of chain of, of actors is, is very difficult. And it's something we'll be researching more at Heoni in, in the coming months. Um, unless there are any really pressing comments at this stage? I suggest we move to the next topic and then we'll in include some of the comments that have now come in the chat in our further discussions. So uh, we'll move to Amy Weatherburn. I'm sorry we missed our introductory slide. <laughs> so we had first John Davis from the University of Manchester and then Amy Weatherburn uh, from Belgium. Um, with you, we'll be talking about the lack of criminal provisions and the kind of those existing uh, models that we have. Um, and as Anina and Anna Greta mentioned in their presentation, the gap between trafficking and well, what one might call mere labor exploitation. Um, how do you th think this gap should be uh, or this void should be filled? 
And also I know that I'll just add this one more point that in your very interesting PhD, I know you argue that there should be kind of a general offense of labor exploitation. So could you kind of explain and, and outline this in a bit more detail? Thank you. OK, thank you very much um, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, I just as brief uh, introduction in terms of my uh, research, like you say, with my PhD, I was very much looking at how better to understand and conceptualize labor exploitation in the context of human trafficking law. Um, and I'll touch upon a few points that related to that in my uh, brief presentation. And then now linked to uh, some of the points that John has raised, my postdoc research is really looking at um, the feasibility of the use of existing labour market enforcement mechanisms to actually tackle um, labour exploitation at that earlier stage. Um, and to uh, yeah to nip it nip it in the bud essentially um, before it really turns into those more severe uh, criminal forms of labour exploitation. Um, but in terms of the uh, the main topic uh, that you've uh, put to me today, of course I'm sure many of us are aware that human trafficking has very much taken a centre stage um, uh, on an international and regional uh, context and is very much the go-to solution for efforts. Um, that seek to tackle the exploitation of purpose uh, of um, exploitation of persons with a dominant response being in the criminal justice context. But as your question alludes to, there are actually many circumstances that uh, of labor exploitation that aren't um, trafficking. Um, and we need to take into account here the context of our current uh, labor market in res regards to deregulation, um, the increasing precarity of workers in low paid and low skilled sectors and the use of zero hour contracts, for example, and agent temporary agency working. Um, and in terms of solving the gap, um, one of the main things um, to stick at the in the um, level of human trafficking is to actually make sure that states do in fact recognize labor exploitation as a form of trafficking, because to date, not all states have included labor exploitation or have only very recently undergone legislative reform to include labor exploitation as a form of trafficking itself. The second aspect I would suggest is to ensure that forms of labour exploitation that are mentioned in the Palermo Protocol are criminalised as separate standalone offences. And so these include offences of slavery, servitude and forced labour. Um, and indeed, these uh, certain uh, these standalone separate offences have actually been um, defined in international law for in the context of slavery almost a century now. Um, but there has been limited engagement by states to actually comply with their international obligations to prohibit them as forms of exploitation in their national law. And as a result of that, we have a limit, limited amount of case law where we can, which we can go to to understand what we mean um, as um, practices and factual circumstances that amount to labour exploitation. Um, we know that this is a problem because uh, research from the uh, University of Nottingham Anti-Slavery Domestic Legislation Database clearly demonstrates that there is a disparity between states who've ratified um, international instruments that um, require a prohibition of these forms of exploitation compared to the states that have actually criminalised these um, in their own national orders. An example um, is with slavery, so the prohibition of slavery, there are 172 states who have ratified the ICCPR and then only um, and 49 percent, so 92 states, have no domestic criminal legislation actually prohibiting slavery. And we can contrast this with trafficking, where there is almost a universal compliance with the obligation to prohibit human trafficking, with 185 out of 193 states having a criminal prohibition of trafficking. Um, so this has problem, this causes problems when it comes to de determining exactly how we should um, inform our future efforts to tackle um, labour exploitation. And as you mentioned in my PhD, one of the things that I tried to do was to move away from this listing and of um, forms of exploitation, um, because with the human trafficking definition leaving significant room for manoeuvre, it does mean that we've seen an expansion of the understanding of labour exploitation in certain contexts and there's a lack of harmonisation. And also the lack of case law means that um, 
very often prosecutors and even judges, some judges in the uh, research I did, they actually came across a case of human trafficking for labour exploitation or forced labour. It was the first case they'd ever encountered and it really is um, something that they've never come across before. So there is this lack of, well, this very embryonic phase, let's say, when it comes to national judges having to deal with this issue. Um, and as you mentioned, in terms of my outcomes, let's say briefly um, for my PhD, um, I, I said, so to nuance slightly um, what you suggested in the sense that I propose a general offence of exploitation. Um, what I did was to propose a conceptualization of exploitation that identified some of the key elements and features that I think should be um, included in our understanding of labour exploitation, and that includes the existing offences of forced labour slavery and then these grey areas that John mentioned. Um, and I think that really the purpose of that is first and foremost to actually assist with the comprehension of the law and the offences that we have currently. Um, and then a possibility is to then perhaps use it as the basis for a, um, a separate offence of human exploitation, as the Swedish, for example, have introduced, um, or of indeed labour exploitation as a separate offence from trafficking. Um, and I think it's personally has um, the, the beginnings of a potentially robust approach to um, adopting such an approach if necessary, but of course, depending my my um, general position overall is to advocate for, as I mentioned, ensuring labour exploitation is recognised in the human trafficking framework and then also to make sure that there is actual emphasis on the existing prohibition and uh, of um, slavery, servitude and forced labour as an international obligation of all states. Thanks, Amy. Um, Following up on this, there's actually a question in the chat now uh, that in the Netherlands, uh, the Labour Inspectorate is advocating for labour exploitation to be categorised as a separate crime from human trafficking, uh, to be more specifically able to tackle these kind of grey or normalised forms of exploitation that John also mentioned. Um, and I know, Amy, that you've looked at the Swedish uh, human exploitation legislation and also at the Finnish extortionate work discrimination uh, criminalization, which is just a separate offense in Finland. Uh, so what's your take on these uh, provisions? Are they kind of a step in the right direction? Um, so uh, just just briefly and just to address the, the Dutch um, proposition, um, I'm aware that it's something that's being it's under discussion. Um, and I think that there the um, issue is, like I mentioned, there is no um, alternative uh, other than human trafficking. Um, there is no offence of forced labour, slavery and servitude. Um, and so that's um, something that is clearly then being advocated, like the question um, is states by uh, labour inspectors to fill the gap with an additional exploitation offence. And indeed, we do, we are starting to see some examples from the Nordic countries with the Swedish and Finnish um, approaches. Um, and one of the and one of the things, um, particularly in regards to the um, Swedish offence of human exploitation, is the emphasis on um, the fact that there's someone who um, there's very much a, a shift away from some of the language that is used in the trafficking context. For example, the abuse, abuse of a position of vulnerability, but here there's an emphasis on a uh, dependence, and it's the same in. Um, uh, the Finnish context, there is an emphasis on how a person may be dependent on um, the employer as a result of the position that they have been put in. Um, and I think both offences can be commended for actually putting the situation of the individual at the at the centre um, and by emphasising that um, it's not necessarily um, uh, an abuse of a position of vulnerability, which is quite difficult to determine, whereas with dependents, there are significant indicators of what dependents might look like, and it could be um, not only in the working context, and I think that is crucial as well, that it goes beyond the workplace. It could be that the employer also provides um, uh, accommodation or the transportation to get to work. It could be that there is a linguistic dependence where there are language skill, language barriers. Um, and I know, again, going back to the Netherlands, that there was a significant emphasis on this uh, dependence in um, in a task force that was set up in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the um, precarious workers and temporary agency workers, etc. Um, so this this concept of dependence is increasingly cropping up. And I'm quite I also work um, 
in the process of um, working on that issue as well um, with a Belgian organization, Pagasa, who um, they also see dependence as a key indicator of um, a situation amounting to exploitation. Um, the, th the one thing maybe to say with the Finnish um, uh, offence of extortion at work discrimination is, of course, that the discrimination element ha is kind of a key element. And then the uh, uh, more aggravating factors such as um, the use of a person's distress or dependence position, lack of understanding, faultfulness or ignorance is then makes the offence extortionate. But of course, the discrimination is needed there first. And the lists of form or grounds of discrimination is, is from what I can tell, exhaustive. Um, and one concern that I would have is that there isn't really any reference to migration status. So the fact that someone might be undocumented, would that then make me mean that they are um, subject to work discrimination and then potentially uh, fall under the bracket of extortionate uh, work discrimination? So I would like to it, I'd be interested to know more about whether this is indeed a limiting factor or whether it can actually doesn't stop the offence from being applied in that context of undocumented or irregular workers. Thanks, Amy. Um, if I just really quickly may respond to this, I think one of the challenges with the discrimination aspect of the extortion at work discrimination in the Finnish context has been the kind of comparison that it entails. Uh, and if, if all the workers are of, of equal kind of migrant origin, but some of them are, are you know, treated worse than the others, you know, who should they be compared to? There's been these kind of situations. But I think on the issue of migratory status that comes from the dependency uh, and the uh, vulnerable position. So it could be kind of, you know, seen from, from that angle. But I don't know if the other panelists want to comment at this stage. On it, please feel free. Thank you. These are incredibly interesting discussions, and I think the whole issue of, of, of well, starting to fill this void, it's an, it's an incredibly interesting development to be followed in in the years to come. And and uh, from my perspective, having worked mostly on on um, sort of assistance and access to justice and, and these types of things, I'll, I'll be very interested to see how how uh, how these um, new ways of approaching it will also be followed by by rights for for victims rights for exploited people uh, that would be a concern if i mean the, it, it would be a concern if if um, these new provisions that are in a way easier <laughs> in brackets to to work with if if um, crimes that would otherwise be investigated as trafficking and, and being followed up as that are being pushed towards these these uh, um, other provisions that may have less protection say, the, for for victims of exploitation, but I think that it's it makes so much sense to me the and particularly the whole issue of dependence as a as terminology. Uh, I think that many many of us who have followed the trafficking field for a very long time feel quite strongly that if if we were to start from scratch today, I don't think that I don't think that this would be the approach that we would choose to address exploitation. So I think that this is in a way it's a it's a it's a time where it's possible maybe to take a step back and reconsider and see what what are efficient, what are our best ways to understand and work in this field. Thank you. Thanks, Annette. Annina. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. A very, very interesting points and in, important points from from you too. Um, I just wanted to comment that um, we're doing a research, a Nordic research, where we're actually um, comparing uh, judgments on on trafficking for forced labor and and labor exploitation, and um, certainly the, the results uh, kind of give in side to this kind of Finnish broad uh, understanding and definition of what forced labor really entails and what kind of aspects. Um, and it, also in, within that, there's a discussion about de dependency, but, but also kind of the freedom of movement in a wider sense that you are not to be locked in to your workplace, but ways in which you are not able to have control over your kind of own life when you are constantly working and if you live together with the employer or in accommodation provided by um, the employer and, and if you uh, are kind of isolated 
um, from the, the society by your employer. So, so there's a kind of a wider di discussion on, on this broader understanding of this. And then when it comes to extortionate work discrimination, I just wanted to highlight that we've had that legislation actually from 2004 onwards. So it was criminalized in the Finnish context the same year as, as trafficking. Um, and, and, and in the report, uh, we do some um, uh, recommendations regarding this discriminalization of uh, extortionate work discrimination that that currently so it, it works but but most often the the sentence for this is a kind of small fine and and and, and we we do feel that there is a quite still uh, sort of gap when it comes then to kind of sentences if you compare it with with trafficking um so so maybe there there's something in in that way that that should be developed in in, in the future and and there are some interesting uh, propositions from from different actors on uh, whether we should somehow uh, redefine this or tweak this criminalization a bit so we'll see what will happen in in the future when it comes to this thanks Thanks, Anina. One thing that we noted also when we did the study on various models in European countries was that uh, it seems that in many countries there aren't any parallel or secondary criminal provisions uh, in prosecutions. So if your trafficking charge fails, basically the whole case is acquitted. So what's your take on this? Could, for instance, I know that in Finland they've used the, the provision of, uh, ex, you know, of usury, for instance, as a parallel provision in some cases. So what's your take on this for the other countries? Um, so this was something that um, I have come across more specifically in Belgium and the Netherlands um, as a result of uh, an ILO study I co-authored that looked at access to justice and remedy for victims of labour exploitation. And the impetus for that really was a bit uh, um, like Annette has mentioned, is this idea that um, if someone isn't granted the human trafficking victim status, then also the, the rights um, in terms of support and assistance are completely different or indeed non-existent. Um, and the problem we have is that prosec uh, prosecution prosecutors often feel that there is a high threshold to actually have a successful human trafficking um, conviction and as a result they may well go and seek um, prosecutions on the basis of less serious offences like you've like you've mentioned and what tends to happen in practice is that they there is a shift towards uh, either yeah criminal offences with a less severe punishment or indeed in Belgium because we have a social criminal code there is also a shift to offences that fall under the social penal code um, and there the um, sanction will depend on uh, the severity of the crime and there's different types of sanctions ranging from administrative fines right up to the possibility of a custodial sentence um, but the point that or the issue that we have with that perspective is this access to justice and remedy for victims in terms of their possibility of compensation um, and uh, payments of unpaid wages or indeed compensation from a non-pecuniary perspective. Um, and it really is something that um, there are channels available, but very often they can be quite burdensome for the worker or the victim themselves. Um, and so, for example, if you have to resort to civil proceedings to seek remedy, then there is a reversal of the burden of proof. Um, there is uh, potential costs and it can be t it can take a long time. The proceedings can be quite timely and there's no guarantee of success at the end of it all. Um, and similarly, where there are compensation funds, um, they're not always known by the workers. And as a result, they don't know when to apply or how to apply what the time frame is. There's sometimes limits in terms of time limits. Um, and so for that, they really need um, the assistance, like uh, John mentioned, of um, uh, trade unions and other support organisations. And that, of course, um, is not something that is often available to all, all workers. So that's really something that if you are to, and of course, the biggest thing for third country nationals is the visa. So if you are given victim status of trafficking, you are then entitled to um, temporary temporary and hopefully long-term um, uh, resident status and access to the labour market. But if you aren't a trafficking victim, then there are 
no possibilities of regularization. Um, and a, a recommendation that we made was to better implement the provisions of the Employer Sanctions Directive, where there is, or there should be at least, um, the possibility for a temporary permit while um, proceedings are ongoing, and then up until the point that they to actually recuperate any unpaid wages. Um, so that's some, and of course that could take years. So technically these workers should be entitled to this type of re regularization, but in practice, it's something that is um, very, very rarely implemented. Thanks, Amy. Um, uh, I think we will move to our third topic because Amy already introduced it so well. So I'll give the floor next to Annette. Um, you mentioned already, uh, Amy, this this problem that if if a um, person's experience is not defined as trafficking, this very much in many ways limits this person's access to both justice, perhaps, but also access uh, to services. Um, so one of the key challenges that we identify in our, our recent report is that victims of mere labor exploitation, they rarely get access to justice and support. And, and as you've already noted, in most countries, it's only victims of trafficking who have these kind of, I don't know, specialized or, or, or specific rights, including the residence permits, as you, Amy, mentioned. So what do you think, Annette, about all the others? Like who should get assistance and what assistance should they get? Since our system is now very much built on the presumption of a criminal justice process. Yes, well, I, I, it, this is this I think is such a central question in the way that this field is developing now. And I, I might just say a few words first about about who I am and what perspective I'm speaking to, because I think that's often that's often quite decisive and becomes very it's a specific angle into this highly complex field, but. I'm a sociologist and I'm a researcher at FAFO, Institute for Labour and Social Research, where I've worked on, on trafficking and exploitation issues since 2002, mainly in Norway, but also in the Balkans. And it's been a very interesting period to, to follow the policy framework of human trafficking, um, particularly. Um, but also how developments and societal changes, of which there have been many, obviously, during this time, how this influences how exploitation is understood and responded to. And I think that particularly in recent years, with a, with a much increased focus on labour exploitation, this has illuminated uh, a lot of aspects and a lot of cracks, really, in the policy framework of, of human trafficking. And so, well, assistance and access to uh, assistance has has absolutely has been a very central uh, aspect of my research in several projects. And and uh, uh, the trafficking framework, in in many ways, it sets up this very sharp, way way too sharp, an imaginary division between sort of the exploited and the non-exploited in a way. It's it's very sharp, this, this divide. There's an idea that you have sort of freedom and unfreedom, um, but it doesn't really take much prior knowledge to know that, that this is a sliding scale. There are different degrees of exploitation that can't be sharply distinguished. We've seen this even within sort of the same the same trafficking case where the, the, the personal situation of one victim, I mean, the, the working, working conditions were more or less the same for, for all. Uh, the personal situation and vulnerability of one person meant that, that this was a trafficking case for his colleagues with slightly different, slightly better networks, for instance, slightly more alternatives. It was not trafficking. So so it's it's uh, it's it's something that doesn't quite it doesn't quite uh, mesh with the reality that we observe, um, and of course then this this does become a huge problem and it's made worse when access to assistance becomes so dependent on how criminal justice uh, defines an experience and and very often as I as I uh, mentioned in my comment this can very often be for pragmatic reasons. It's a it's a recurring theme um, in in Norway that that it's so difficult to prove these aspects of exploitation of vulnerability that amount to trafficking, that uh, in order to to ensure a conviction, it's quite common to go for these lesser <laughs> lesser crimes, so to speak, and and. Uh, 
And uh, so even in quite serious cases, there can be this arbitrariness in, in terms of access to assistance. So but I think in terms of who should get access to what, I think it's useful to take one step back and think, OK, what what is it that assistance does? Well, it it can compensate for for uh, the lack of resources that that other people have or that it's common to have. And and so I think one thing is uh, is to to think about how assistance can help secure access to justice, recovery, remedy for individuals. But I think that it's also this issue of, of how assistance can uh, prevent future exploitation by reducing risk factors. And I think that this is lacking a little bit for, from the way that we speak about assistance. It becomes very much about sort of securing individual access to to for instance criminal proceedings um i think that there is another and, and more it's a wider societal issue of of preventing future exploitation by reducing risk factors and obviously in my work with trafficking victims over two decades it's not it's not as if trafficking is something that usually hits people out of the blue in an otherwise happy life uh, where they have access to everything they need or all their all their basic needs covered. So I think that also to look at the vulnerability of migrant workers and, and just to say, that, OK, this is a group that that may very well be exploited at some point to to the point where it can be trafficking. So this for me is a very strong argument for providing providing access to assistance beyond just the, the, the point of individual um, uh, access to justice. Uh, and I think that, frankly, also the the the, um, the Council of Europe Convention on Trafficking, Article Five, also states that states have have a duty to prevent uh, trafficking and to have measures for for parts of the population that may be particularly vulnerable. I think definitely migrant migrant workers in certain situations fill those those criteria. So. Uh, I know I can go on and on about this, but I'll try to close. Um, I think it's it's a question of, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to answer very specifically what exactly should people have access to. I think it's very contextual and it's also very individual. But but I think that uh, we might also sort of question a little bit what, what assistance is. Um, I think at present, certainly in Norway at least, I know this differs a lot, but rights to assistance for trafficking victims, they are on paper at least very extensive and I think that discussions about extending these exact same rights to anyone who has been in an exploitative work situation I don't think it's going to fly I, I think that it's just not it's not realistic but this very basic and graduated assistance not least in the field of legal assistance which is it's so it's so foundational but also including personal support as needed um i think it should definitely be more available and and that this would be an advantage not only to to individuals but also at in a broader societal issue in order to be able to actually address um, these issues of exploitation and what is happening in in our labor markets thanks thanks Hamid. a lot of really interesting points um does any one of the other panelists want to comment at this stage Okay, if not, Amy? Uh, yeah, just um, I, I just want to pick up on this idea of a contextual and individualized approach because it's certainly something that I um, came to a similar conclusion in my own research where um, it is really important to take individual each individual case um, into account because very often, in, particularly in labor exploitation, there is the possibility of quite large groups of workers being identified um, and uh, it may be there are some workers who are valued over and above others and potentially treated slightly better so their overall working situation um, may vary and so it's important not to accept that all workers are treated exactly the same that being said the, the what then tends to happen in those group cases is that uh, if there is a criminal prosecution, only certain workers will be recognised as victims of trafficking and then included on any indictment and then potentially then given access to um, 
uh, then entitled to compensation at the end of the process. Um, so what I would really strongly urge there is that actually still all workers identified are taken into account so that any unpaid wages, for example, can be um, still recuperated and that they're not excluded. But indeed, the different levels of treatment um, can certainly be something that is taken into account or should be taken into account. And then on the point of what type of assistance should be available, I agree, it's not necessarily saying that everybody should be granted the same rights as trafficking victims. But like Annette mentioned, legal assistance at the very least, or at least information and awareness raising of their rights um, is something that's crucial so that they know how to access um, certain mechanisms where they can then claim, uh, um, even if, the, for example, uh, compensation for workplace accidents, I mean, that is something that they should be told about and, if necessary, given support via a trade union or another organisation. Um, and I think there that just a final point then is just to, to mention that these workers often have quite a high level of resilience and they also, we need to think about their own agency and very often what they want is to be given what they're entitled to in terms of unpaid wages and they want to move on. Um, so we don't necessarily want to embroil everybody in really lengthy proceedings. Of course, the more severe cases absolutely need to be pursued as in with the most serious criminal offences and serious prosecutions. But there are certain workers who perhaps don't fit the bill of trafficking victims, but still need some form of redress and then an assistance with that and then so that they can then move on. Thanks, Amy. Uh, John, you've interviewed several victims of labour exploitation and, and people involved in the field. Uh, what's your take from the UK perspective? Um, what do you think that people who have endured this exploitation, what do they want or what would they need in terms of support and assistance? Yeah, thanks. I, I think I'd echo what the others have already said, so I won't repeat that. But um, yeah, I, I think as we've already established, for those who are identified as, um, you know, either exploited or not exploited. That that's the way that the in the UK we have the national referral mechanism where it's set up that way, where you, you're identified as a as a victim or not. And um, for those who who don't go through that referral process, the the support's very patchy. It's very piecemeal. There's not much there in terms of systematic support. And of course, you've got many law enforcement bodies or or whoever else who are unable or unwilling to deal with those less severe instances. Um, I did some, as part of my research, I, I did some work with migrant support organisations. And I think just unpacking that question that Annette referred to of what do we mean by assistance? Um, so of course, sometimes the, the work and, and those experiences don't meet the, meet the threshold of modern slavery. So what we what we often found was that the, the workers wanted us to just matter to the employer. And, you know, the, the employees were often quite surprised to hear from from us who, who were kind of acting as a third party or a mediator between okay. between them and the, the worker. So I think as part of that, what we found was that we needed to understand why some workers were reluctant to discuss the issues, why they were reluctant to come so forward, for example. And um, some of them were quite sceptical of enforcement and even trade unions. Uh, you know, my understanding is that some some countries in in Europe, maybe maybe Eastern Europe, for example, uh, you know, there can be that scepticism of of support, such as uh, what trade unions can provide. So, uh, maybe as well, some people don't see themselves as victims. Uh, you, you know, if they if they're being exploited and they know something's wrong, then um, they they think that the positives might outweigh the the negatives in the sense that they've got work, they've got some sense of agency and independence and somewhere to live, etc. Whereas going through a, a criminal prosecution or something similar might disrupt that process for them. So, yeah, as, as Amy mentioned, it's uh, it's important to think about that sense of agency as well. Thanks, John. I see Anima has raised her hand, please. <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, thanks. Uh, also, very, very good points from um, all three of you. Um, I just wanted to kind of um, add that, at least in the Nordic context, the, the, the role of trade unions is extremely important and we have a very high percentage of uh, us uh, that are members of, of a, a trade union in comparison to a lot of um, other European countries. But then, of course, migrant workers do not necessarily and often do not belong to trade unions. 
But since trade unions are very much specialized in dealing with these issues and also in terms of providing legal uh, assistance and aid, um, I think it's extremely important to have them in, in, involved and, 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 and providing services um, and such as providing information and, and advice for uh, exploited migrant workers. And, 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 and that would then help them, I think, um, keep kind of a respect for all the rights of all workers and, and you know, making sure that we don't have a kind of a, a different labor market for, for migrant workers where labor exploitation is, is prominent. Um, and also in terms of um, uh, residents, um, I thought it was uh, very important that we've now had um, a change in the Finnish Aliens Act uh, since uh, this uh, October, where the, um, um, exploited migrant workers uh, can get one year residence permit um, with, so that um, they can find a new employment and, and this is not like a sector specific residence permit. So um, if they have been um, exploited in the restaurant sector, for example, um, they can then uh, look for a job in another sector as, as well. Um, and and for in order for them to get this um, uh, residence permit, they don't actually have to file a report to the police, for example, to say that um, to you know make a criminal uh, report out of uh, their experience. So that hopefully will also um, um, make it easier for them to actually use this opportunity um, and and try to find. Um, a job in a non-exploitative workplace. Um, thank you. Thanks, Anina. Anit, you want to comment? You have the mic turned off. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Uh, when Anina mentioned uh, unions, it just occurred to me that I should mention an extremely recent development in, in Norway. Well, only yesterday that the uh, that uh, the, the biggest union, ELO, uh, decided to make permanent a, a trial a project with legal aid to, uh, to um, uh, workers who are outside of the ordinary uh, work life. I'm just reading actually from their, their Facebook post here, uh, trying to translate as I go, uh, who are outside of the ordinary work life, either, either because they have been exposed to, uh, to coercion or uh, gross exploitation or are particularly vulnerable. So I think that this is a very interesting, it's an interesting approach. I think that there are other unions who also do the same thing and where they put aside the very strong principle of membership uh, and provide uh, legal assistance as part of a broader strategy against social dumping and, and uh, to contribute in um, in a, a healthier development of, uh, of the labor market. So that was that was all. Thanks, Annette. Uh, there's an important point, I think, in the in the chat, or several important points, but I'll raise one. Uh, there's there's one comment saying that instead of uh, states providing to victims what they kind of uh, what they can, uh, the focus should be on on identifying the individual needs of each victim. Um, and I think this is something that the countries, I think, struggle with. Uh, and and one recent development in Finland is that there's a big discussion on this that, that we already raised in the discussion here that that why is it that certain categorizations which are also based on the criminal justice approach define who should get access to what. Uh, so instead the focus should be on universal services instead of services created for specific victims. And, and that I think is, a, is an admirable goal but I think the problem currently is that we don't have sufficient resources to have kind of universal services for everyone. So at the moment we have these specific services for specific categories uh, stemming also from international legal obligations. So I don't know if, if you have a similar discussion in your countries that, that is there a kind of a, in a way, a, a, a reformulation of assistance in general, which should be based on individual needs rather than on how your ordeal is defined by somebody else, for instance, the criminal justice process. I don't know if you, you catch what I'm trying to say. 
I think it's been fairly recent development in, in the UK, well, a few recent developments um, that, that kind of follows on from, from the question around treating victims based on their individual needs. Um, I, I suppose one of the issues, issues to think about there is that one of those developments has been um, the, the Immigration Enforcement Competent Authority, um, who's a new, a fairly new body to help identify victims of modern slavery. And there's a lot of concern there that that's, go that's going to have a serious impact on victims because it's reinforcing a trend that immigration enforcement gets conflated with labour market problems, labour market regulation. And so you have that concern that some victims won't even come forward um, or, or consent to that, that referral process to be formally identified as a victim. So, yeah, I, I can see the, the merit in treating victims as individuals and, and trying to tailor those forms of support, because otherwise you get these very general approaches where um, immigration enforcement gets tangled up with protection and support for victims. So if they don't have the right kind of immigration status, then that could have a negative impact on, on victims, victims and workers. Thanks, John. Annette, please. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is obviously it's a very foundational issue with the whole um, the whole the whole <laughs> approach that is so embedded in in the trafficking uh, trafficking approach. Uh, and I think the whole issue with the reflection period and how this is framed as it's not not necessarily primarily a means for assisting people. It's it's a means for facilitating prosecution. So it it implies a very I mean, it's it's presented as, as if it's two equal goals. Uh, in practice, that's not the way it's going to work. It's always going to be the criminal criminal justice perspective that's going to be dominant. Um, I actually written an article about that called uh, Two Birds with One Stone, question <laughs> mark. And uh, it should be pretty clear what what um, what uh, what I think about that. And um, and I think that it it also well it. It stands in the way of uncovering uh, exploitation. And but there, there was actually another point that I also wanted to make in terms of, of uh, this whole more individualized access to assistance. And I think it's important to remember that at least from, from where I stand and in my context, there are a lot of people who have, for instance, if we're talking about EU or EEA uh, migrants, they have rights. Uh, in Norway, but it's incredibly difficult for them to access them without extensive assistance in actually accessing the system in which they have rights. So uh, it's sometimes I wonder if if um, if the rights of of people in these categories are seen as sort of a an optional <laughs> that it's something that that the state can can be benevolent and grant access to if they so choose. Um, there is a very central concept in in uh, in uh, Norwegian public services generally. It's equal um, equal equal public services uh, for for Scandinavian speakers. Like uh, and uh, which implies also making making provisions to make sure that that people can access services equally. Not necessarily that all services are offered equally, but that the access is is more equal or equalized, and that you may put in special measures to make sure that people can access them. And I I find that this is often lacking for the group that we are talking about today. Thanks, Anet. Uh, I want to hear at the very end raise two of the comments that have been uh, included in the chat. There's one question that kind of follows upon what you on it said earlier. Uh, we had this discussion on on uh, various provisions and how to fill this void between trafficking and other forms of exploitation. So there's a question that what if if it's easier to address kind of this trafficking light? Uh, Will it lead to a situation where law enforcement does not initiate investigations for trafficking because it's seen as more complicated than this alternative provision? That's the first question. And then the second question is related to what you Anet just said now recently. Um, there's a proposed initiative for an EU-wide social security number. Uh, the question here is whether it could help in identifying cross-country labor exploitation, but I think the question is also would it assist in, in accessing 
services. I know that EU citizens already should basically, in at least in some situations, have access to services. But but is this some an initiative that you think would would assist also in the service provision? Anybody, please feel free who wants to answer. Uh, um, Amy. Yeah, so ha <laughs> I should put my hand up. Sorry, it's rude. Um, the, just for the first question then about whether or not this means that we will be essentially replacing or will lead to even less um, efforts to prosecute trafficking. Um, from my perspective, my emphasis is very much on um, that we actually need to better understand um, the traf anti-trafficking framework, specifically in the context of labour exploitation, which is why my doctoral research is limited to trafficking. Um, I don't go beyond trafficking. Um, and we see that already, though, also at the Council of Europe level, where there is this um, uh, committee that has been established to better understand trafficking, and they're going to be um, drafting a resolution on trafficking labour exploitation. So I still think there is the will and the, you know, impetus to better understand what we mean by trafficking to then facilitate labour exploit uh, trafficking for labour exploitation prosecutions. Um, one thing going back to this idea of a general offence of exploitation, a concern potentially that I would have um, and even with the use of dependence, even though I, I do see it in reality in practice that that is a significant issue is the shift away and the use of quite broad and vague terminology um, in some of the offences. So, for example, um, the, the Dutch example is the idea of a serious disadvantage. So if there is the indicator of a serious disadvantage, then this could be an in potential for labour exploitation. But also uh, the Swedish in offence includes difficult situation or in the Finnish, there's the idea of any other form of distress. I mean, they're quite, they're not, terms that we've necessarily come to grips with um, or have yet to come to grips with. Um, and whereas my conceptualization still tries to stay close to the language that we're used to in terms of abusive position of vulnerability, lack of real or acceptable alternatives, exercise of control, which is where the dependence thing then comes into play. Um, and I think that's something that we still need to tackle um, to better understand the concepts that we have rather than adding to our terminology um, and potentially in a, for, for legal clarity as well. We need to try our best to make sure that we still make efforts to tackle human trafficking. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> On it, please. Microphone, sorry. Sorry, you keep forgetting. Thank you. Um, I can't really add much, obviously, to what uh, what uh, Amy says about this because this is this is, we're so lucky to have um, someone who's so expert in that field. But I think that in terms of the the trafficking lights um, uh, provisions, that that I mean, just speaking from experience and looking at what has happened through so many um, so many prosecutions in the uh, with the uh, trafficking for prostitution, so many offences are pushed towards the pimping. Um, uh, laws on pimping, for instance, in, in Norway, to the extent actually that there were uh, changes made in the legislation uh, pertaining to uh, reflection periods or, or the, the permanent residence for uh, witnesses in trafficking trials to actually include also cases where charges were pressed for pimping and not trafficking in cases where there was reason to believe that the person would be in a in an equally difficult situation or something. I, I, it's not a it's not a correct um, translation translation, of course. But so so I think that it's but it's also a question of okay, is it necessarily such a huge problem if if these provisions are used more? If this is a more effective way of of actually targeting exploitation, then maybe it's not such a huge problem because it's something about trying to keep our eye on the goal and and trying to think about what is justice in in this context. And so, as long as as long as it's actually also followed up with with the same or equal or or at least appropriate measures for people who are exploited, then I I wouldn't necessarily be so concerned precisely because the trafficking framework can be so clunky to work with. Thanks, thanks. I think that's a really important point. Uh, do we have any additional comments from the panelists? If not, 
we have some some general questions in the chat. Um, for instance, um, on the problem of uh, what if trade unions do not really follow uh, labor law or where the clash between immigration law and labor law. But I'm afraid we have not very much time, so I'm, I'm, I don't know if we can answer these questions. But I think this is a, a problem that we all see in our countries. Um, I suggest we move towards the closing of this webinar. Anna Greta, if you can take the next slide, please. Uh, I first want to make a bit of an advertisement for Helene's work. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've done a lot of research on, on trafficking and labor exploitation in particular. All our materials are available on our website free of charge. Uh, and uh, last year and the year before, we worked on a project where we looked at the financial business model of labor exploitation and developed uh, two very useful tools that I want to advertise. Uh, one is an investigation tool and checklist for labor inspectors and police officers. Uh, it's a very hands-on tool on how to build your investigation in cases of labor exploitation and labor trafficking. Uh, and then we have a business toolkit and a normative framework, which are tools for businesses and, and entrepreneurs who are interested in uh, preventing labor exploitation in their supply chain, also with very practical steps on how to do this. Uh, and the normative framework tool also includes some contractual clauses that could be included in contracts with suppliers uh, to address this problem. And we also have some policy briefs and other materials, so please feel free to visit our website. Um, we'll share this presentation so you get these links uh, afterwards. And then also please uh, subscribe to our newsletter for our uh, information on our activities. And as I mentioned at the very beginning on uh, Thursday, I think it is, we'll be launching our new tool for public procurement uh, officers on how to prevent exploitation in local national supply chains. All right, we are nearing the end of the webinar. I want to sincerely thank all our excellent panelists. Thank you, John, Amy and Annette, and also Annina and Anna Greta for your really interesting input and discussion. Also, thank you to Alexandra, our colleague who has been handling the technicalities of the webinar. She's adding some stuff in the chat for, for your perusal. Thank you all participants. It has been a great pleasure and I wish you all a great continuation of the day. Thank you so much. And sorry for the panelists, can you please stay online for just a short moment? Thank you. Thanks everyone.